USS Wasp, the seventh American aircraft carrier, a ship designed and built to use up leftover tonnage, is the topic of today's video. Her genesis is one of compromise, fully known and accepted, in the hunt for the most planes possible on as small a ship as possible. This was done with full knowledge that the result would always be less than satisfactory in comparison to a larger ship, but in light of the limitations of the Washington Treaty, the United States Navy made their choice. They desired to use all the allocated tonnage, no matter the resultant compromises. Wasp would, in the end, suffer for that choice. Her origin is a fairly simple one, all told. As mentioned, the Washington Treaty imposed certain limitations on every major navy in regards to aircraft carrier tonnage. With the conversion of Lexington and Saratoga, treaty busting as they were, legal loopholes aside, and the construction of the small carrier Ranger, the USN was left with limited tonnage to play with. The design process of the Yorktown class, in this regard, will be interesting to cover for its examples of how treaties change design ideals and choices, but that's a topic for another video. The important note to make here is that, in deciding on the Yorktowns, the Navy went with a compromise design of slightly less than 20,000 tons, instead of the 27,000 ton design they really wanted, or a slightly smaller 23,000 ton one for that matter. This choice left them with something around 15,000 tons of spare tonnage, provided they took Langley out of the equation. Considering she was never a proper combat warship, converting her to a seaplane tender to free up the tonnage for what would become Wasp was something of a no-brainer. With that spare tonnage to use, the design of Wasp was begun. Drawing on a parallel 15,200 ton design option for the Yorktowns, Wasp was, from the start, something of a baby Yorktown. As her design process went along, these similarities continued, right down to being something of a torturous process as a whole. You see, while the USN was originally, Lex and Sarah aside, trying to be careful to leave margins in any treaty-limited design to be on the safe side, in regards to accidentally doing a treaty violation, by the time Wasp was being designed, that had definitely changed. They were now trying to get literally every single ton out of a design, margins be damned, with the full intention of using every last ounce of weight they could get. This is something of an issue designing a carrier in the 1930s, since technology was so rapidly developing. Ranger, for example, wasn't even commissioned yet when Wasp's design work began. There were no lessons to be learned from her in terms of practical service. Even things so critical to USN carrier design at the time, like the open hangar deck critical to running engines of planes up prior to raising them to the flight deck, was still a hypothetical at this point. It is perhaps telling that there was a brief period where there was, and I'm not even joking here, serious consideration given to allowing Wasp to launch planes from her hangar deck in a two-decker system, something akin to what the British and Japanese were doing, and would soon stop doing when it became apparent that planes were getting far and away too big and heavy for anything but a full-size flight deck to be usable. That, however, is also a topic for another video, because while I could go on and on about Wasp's design process, I'll cut it here by saying that the resulting ship was filled with compromises, as I mentioned earlier. In the hunt for weight savings, she was very lightly protected in both terms of usual armor and, more importantly for later, torpedo defense. The latter of which was, for all intents and purposes, pretty much non-existent. Her flight deck was also so constrained by her beam that in addition to saving weight, she had to be fitted with the first deck edge elevator on an American carrier. While this did set a future precedent, the one on Wasp was something less of an elevator, and more of some weird hack job thing. It only had a solid portion right up on the ship, sufficient for the front wheels of the aircraft, mind you, but not much more than that. The tail, wheel and all, had to be stuck on an outrigger that looks... less than secure. It was done with the intention of helping to save weight, sure, but also with the all-encompassing American goal of getting the most possible planes on any given carrier. That is true of just about every choice made in Wasp's design. Everything was subordinated to getting the largest air wing possible on her limited tonnage. In this, there was admittedly some level of success. 
Wasp could carry the same air wing as her larger half-sisters. Still, her compromises and protection would come back to haunt her. Furthermore, with her power plant only managing 70,000 shaft horsepower on two shafts instead of four, she could only get up to just shy of 30 knots. This is slower and less powerful than even the Independence class light carriers with their cruiser power plant. The real shame about all this, honestly, is that Friedman notes there were some serious discussions about getting more tonnage for her design by simply removing the 8-inch guns from the Lexingtons. That would free up, not quite enough, but it would free up enough tonnage to at least give her rudimentary extra protection. The problem was, even the aviators were for some inexplicable reason extremely attached to those useless guns, so... I'll admit this mostly serves as an example of just how tight tonnage allowances were at the time, that just removing questionable guns from the conversions could have freed up enough to give Wasp at least rudimentary protection from torpedoes, or improved her bomb and shell protection. When Wasp was laid down on April 1st, 1936, she would be a bit on the heavy end for her stated design tonnage, though this wouldn't be a completely apparent until she had actually been launched which would come three years later on April 4th of 1939. Her commissioning would follow in 1940, by which point war clouds were definitely on the horizon. Initially equipped with eight 5-inch guns, 16 1.1-inch cannon in four of the typical Chicago piano quad mounts, and 24 50 caliber machine guns, WASP's protection was about standard for American carriers at the time, not the greatest, not the worst, just kinda average. Her service, on the other hand, would prove to be anything but standard. The Navy was fully aware of WASP's deficiencies in comparison to the larger carriers. As a direct result, she would spend most of her career serving alongside the similarly limited Ranger in the Atlantic. Her early service was largely kept to training missions and neutrality patrols, interspersed with the occasional experimental mission one of which would prove to foreshadow her most common duty later in life. That is, loading up a couple dozen P-40Bs of the Army Air Corps, it was not the Army Air Force yet at that point, for tests comparing their takeoff runs with Navy aircraft on October 11th, 1940, as well as a more general testing of operating Army planes from Navy ships. It proved to be a rousing success and a portent of future events. After that test, though, Wasp went back to the same old, same old things she had been doing beforehand. Until, come July 1941, she was assigned to assist the occupation of Iceland. One of the more provocative measures the United States took in the undeclared naval war with Germany, prior to the actual war kicking off. Wasp's role, however, was limited to once more playing ferry for Army P-40s that flew off to Iceland. Wasp played no further role in that flagrant violation of Iceland's neutrality, instead returning to doing neutrality patrols and convoy escorts. The undeclared war with Germany would continue in this regard until the actual war began. Wasp was still doing the usual missions in the Atlantic when Pearl Harbor was attacked and she was promptly thrust into a real shooting war. Her missions continued to be fairly uneventful at first, though. The same exact kind she had already been doing with a side of watching the Vichy French warily in the Caribbean, until it became apparent they weren't going to get up to anything. Whereupon, Wasp would follow in the footsteps of the old battleships in the Great War, and get sent to Britain to reinforce the Royal Navy. Before she could do that, though, Wasp would proceed to prove that she was lightly built, but not weak. Because she contrived to ram her escorting destroyer, USS Stack, in foul weather. Stack had a hole sufficient to flood her forward fire room punched at her side. Wasp shrugged it off and made port before sailing just three days later to the UK. Not the best way to prove she was a tough ship, but I guess it works. Kind of sucks for Stack, though. Upon arrival in Britain, while Wasp was sent to reinforce the Royal Navy, she would in fact be commandeered to reinforce the Royal Air Force instead. More specifically, she would be assigned to serve as a ferry again, this time carrying Spitfires to Malta in the Mediterranean. 
Her experience in flying off Army aircraft came in handy in what is, honestly, the most famous role she would serve, save for her ultimate sinking. Arguably more famous, really, at least in Britain. The first ferry run would see Wasp place her torpedo in dive bombers ashore in the UK, while she took on 47 Supermarine Spitfires for the embattled island fortress. Remember how I mentioned she had the open flight deck for running up engines of aircraft? Even before it was seen as necessary by American designers to actually do that. That came in handy here. For as Wasp entered into the Mediterranean, she would send up some of her Wildcats as a combat air patrol, while the Spitfires on her hangar deck were warming their engines to set off on their own. By being able to do so, this allowed for Wasp to provide her own air cover, while the Spitfires could be launched very rapidly once close enough to Malta. Unfortunately, this expedient would prove to be largely wasted effort, as the Germans and Italians promptly blew up most of those Spitfires on the ground. Churchill made a personal plea to Roosevelt for Wasp to do the same mission again, something along the lines of let Wasp sting again, and Roosevelt agreed. Wasp was promptly loaded up with yet more Spitfires and dispatched, along with the aging HMS Eagle, to reinforce Malta once again. This time, she had the interesting experience of recovering one of those Spitfires. A plane piloted by one Gerald Smith had fuel troubles, and Wasp had to rush to take his plane back aboard. In an example of admittedly excellent piloting skills, the British pilot would bring his plane, not at all designed for carrier landings, as this is a baseline spit and not a sea fire, down perfectly, albeit dangerously close to going off the front of her flight deck. This excitement done, Wasp returned towards Britain, treated to the bemusement of hearing that the Germans had sunk her. After presumably looking around, raising their eyebrows, and getting a good chuckle out of it, the crew treated it as the joke it was, and went about their business while being praised by Churchill for their efforts. However, while Wasp was playing glorified fairy for the RAF, the battles of Coral Sea and Midway had gone down in the Pacific. While the Japanese certainly took the worst losses there, the USN was still down two carriers of their own. With Ranger even less fit for Pacific duty than Wasp, the older carrier took her place in assisting the British, while Wasp set off for the Pacific. After a short refit and swapping her aging Vindicator dive bombers and Devastator torpedo bombers for modern-ish Dauntlesses and definitely modern Avengers, Wasp entered in the Pacific. She would never return to the Atlantic. Upon arrival in the South Pacific, Wasp would join with Hornet, Enterprise, and Saratoga in the Guadalcanal campaign. She would serve admirably here, her planes and pilots proving themselves just as skilled as those of the other carriers. Some minor turbine issues on the way in had not noticeably impacted Wasp's actual service, though her smaller size would end up doing so. For when the Battle of the Eastern Solomons saw Enterprise damaged and forced to temporarily pull back, Wasp was off being refueled. She did not participate in that battle, and the soon-to-come second torpedoing of Saratoga, would see Wasp and the very new Hornets, the only carriers in ship shape for combat operations. It would be serving alongside Hornet and the battleship North Carolina on a return to convoy escort that Wasp would meet her fate. Escorting reinforcements to Guadalcanal on September 15, 1942, Wasp was operating her planes and doing the usual things of a carrier at war, when no fewer than six torpedoes were fired in her direction. The submarine, I-19, soon to have the most wildly successful single salvo of any Japanese submarine, had launched a full spread at Wasp. While those torpedoes were, admittedly, the smaller submarine version of the Long Lance, they were still incredibly dangerous torpedoes. Though with Wasp's lack of protection, any torpedo was a problem for her. It hardly mattered the specifics when three of them slammed into Wasp in probably the worst possible place they could have hit. Her vulnerable aviation fuels, tanks, and magazines. Her lack of torpedo defenses likely doomed her here, though it is worth noting that one of the torpedoes actually breached the surface of the water and contrived to hit her above the waterline, which certainly didn't help matters. <laughs> 
The other torpedoes in the salvo would see one miss, one hit the destroyer O'Brien, causing enough damage to sink her a month later, and the final one hit North Carolina, putting her out of action until November. The torpedo hits to Wasp immediately wrecked every plane aboard, even sending the planes hanging from the top of her hangar, crashing down on the ones on her deck. Fires and sympathetic detonations raged along the ship, further damaging her firefighting equipment. A fire, listing terribly and crippled by the hits, Wasp was doomed. Her light protection had done nothing to resist the torpedoes, and the fires were quickly going out of control. This prompted more fuel explosions and yet more damage. With little ability to fight the fires in spite of their brave efforts, it was quickly becoming apparent that Wasp couldn't be saved. With great reluctance, Captain Sherman ordered Wasp abandoned. Just like her half-sister Hornet, however, Wasp would prove surprisingly stubborn, remaining afloat in spite of the fires and explosions until the destroyer Lansdowne had to fire multiple torpedoes into her to finish the job. Wasp continued to refuse to sink, until, around 9pm that night, she finally went under in the center of a burning oil slick all around her. For how lightly built and terribly protected she was, Wasp proved to still have that classic Yorktown trait of only going down when taking so much damage that one wondered how she was still afloat. She may have been a baby Yorktown, but in this at least, she was every bit as good as her half-sisters. It wouldn't be until 2019 that her wreck would be found, about 4 kilometers down, in more or less one piece. She is so well preserved that even the fire damage to her paint is still visible. It's a testament to her builders that, in spite of all the damage she took in the time underwater, she's still in such good shape. Thank you for watching, and remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content.